the fuck up! You shove cucumbers down your pussy! Shut the fuck up! I said you shove cucumbers down your pussy! Shut the fuck up! Who you trying to get crazy with this, see? Don't you know I'm loco? I want you to picture the protagonist from Hatred. Dark, brooding, angsty, ready to unsheath his katana at a moment's notice. Now take that image, that personification of rage incarnate, and put him in a pretty dress. Because deep down, he wants to be a little girl. Add on top of that the fact that he is a huge fan of My Little Pony. There he stands before you, with shotgun in hand, in his pretty high heels and his MLP hat ready to enact his plan. And what's his master plan? That if he kills enough people, if he murders enough people before killing himself, he will be reincarnated as a second string character from a Nickelodeon cartoon show. But our angsty, transsexual brony, who is a huge Nickelodeon fan, isn't a work of fiction. He's Randy Stairs, otherwise known online as Andrew Blaze. Because it was this bizarre amalgamation of a person, this motivation behind an act, that drove Randy to kill three co-workers at the supermarket he worked at, all to attain his goal of becoming a ghost girl in the hereafter. Now, a lot of times when you examine insane people, when you look at the aftermath of an act of violence, there are two things people want to know. The what and the why. Why did they do it? What was the motivation for them doing it? Why was no one there to stop them? What could have prevented this tragedy from happening? But myself, I'm more interested in the when and the how. How did the transformation begin? How did Randy Stairs, somebody who started out on YouTube a decade ago, go from a normal kid to a sociopathic Nickelodeon spree killer? When exactly did he go from normal to batshit insane? One of the major differences between what happened with Randy Stairs and something like a Columbine is the amount of evidence left behind. While it's true that spree killers and mass killers in the past have left behind manifestos, as Randy has, what's different now is that people catalog, they archive their entire life online. And so in the case of Randy Stairs, we have a decade's worth of a history of a footprint of who he was and when this transformation began. So I'm going to take us on a journey. I'm going to show you Randy Stair's descent into pure insanity. Randy Stairs, before he was known online as Andrew Blaze, before he was part of the EGS, the Ghost Squad Spree Killing Nickelodeon Fan Club, was known as Pioneer Productions. Now, Pioneer Productions was a holy fucking shit, what the fuck. Let me make something crystal clear. I don't like Danny Phantom. I'm a Dexter's Lab sort of guy. And as we all know, Cartoon Network fans only commit robberies. I'll pull off a diamond heist, but I'm not going to kill my co-workers because I want to become a transsexual ghost girl. That's just retarded. Now, Pioneer Productions existed since 2008. And one of the first things you're going to notice about the channel, about the content that Randy produces, is that it is completely nondescript. It blends into the crowd. There is nothing unique or surprising about it. In the entirety of the eight years that the channel was up and running, he tried everything and anything to get noticed. It is the quintessential YouTube channel throwing as much shit at the wall, hoping something sticks so you'll find popularity. One of the earliest and best examples of this would be Mr. Horsehead meets Mr. Wooden Alligator. This is from the heyday of YouTube where you could make incredibly shitty content and people would gobble it up, which just sounds like a fucking hoot and a holler to watch. Now, interestingly, this is the most popular video on his channel. That's excluding an upload of a music video that was pulled down due to DMCA. Legally speaking, this is the most popular video he ever produced. And the only reason it has any popularity to it is because he got some heat. 
he got noticed by having a crossover with a much more popular YouTuber at the time. While Make Me Bad 35 has gone the route of Fred nowadays, where nobody really knows who the fuck he is and his videos get barely any views, back in the day he got quite a few. So this was a coup for Randy. And once he got a taste of success, he tried over and over to repeat it by copying the format and trying again and again with whales and frogs and any other kind of children's toy to become as popular as Make Me Bad was. However, for Randy, that never materialized. The videos never garnered many views. And so it was back to the drawing board again. If at first you don't succeed, try fucking anything to get noticed. Another attempt that Pioneer Productions was a part of was again a crossover. This was a channel filmed with his brother and their friends that emulated Jackass, where they'd go out and do stunts to try to garner views. Much like his toy videos, it never really went anywhere. Even when he got a gig making a music video for a band in the local area, he still didn't really get the attention that he was seeking. And this is a common theme played out time and time again on his channel. Over the course of eight years, he could never find something that really attracted an audience. At his peak, even he says that he was always stuck between 8,500 to 9,000 subs. If you've been on YouTube for nearly a decade, that's about 1,000 subs a year, much less than he was hoping for, much less than Make Me Bad 35 had, which was around 1.9 million. And this lack of an audience becomes very visible when you watch the live streams that he engaged in, where he would sit for three hours and talk to no one, all by himself, desperately trying to get somebody to connect to, Between 2011 and 2013, both on YouTube and on other streaming websites, Randy repeatedly attempted to try to be a streamer, and yet never found success. It becomes a common theme with him over and over again. Even when emulating something that's popular, even when riding on a trend, trying to capitalize on something that somebody found success in, Randy is an abject failure, time and time again. And after years of this, you can begin to see the cracks start to show. He starts to release content that becomes much more depressed, much more withdrawn, darker than what he usually did, where he talks about how he's disillusioned with YouTube, where the creative outlet that he enjoyed so much for so many years no longer fills the niche, no longer captures his attention. I'm tired of living in the shadow of other YouTubers, and I'm sick of putting so much work into videos and not getting anywhere with it. You know, I've... I've said that about the gaming channel too, but I've put so much time into my videos and I've just been stuck the last three years in pretty much the same ballpark range of subscribers. It's just always been between, you know, 8,900 to, to 9,000. And uh, it's just not fun anymore. YouTube was the funnest thing I had in my life. I wanted it to be my career, but that's not going to happen. Um, I just, I think it's time for me to stop. And perhaps a portent to the future, in a series of videos, he goes through and methodically kills the characters he created over the course of eight years in his videos, and introduces the new content that he is shifting towards. That new content would be E.G.S. No matter how much time passes, it can't erase the disbelief, the disgust. The pain. The EGS, or Ember's Ghost Squad, was a radical departure from the content that people who were users and subscribers of Pioneer Productions were used to. It was so radically different that Randy took it upon himself in a multitude of videos to explain to them the shift in content they were about to witness. This is a pretty big departure from what you're used to watching from me. I just want to let you know that this is like the point of no return. There is no going back after this. To Randy, this was a new, darker direction with a personal meaning behind it. To the majority of others watching, it was laughably bad flash animation. But nonetheless, Randy wholly dedicated himself to it, creating a social media network to support this entirely new entertainment property. From Instagram to wiki accounts, Facebook, and multiple Twitters, he solely dedicated his time to creating this new content, something which he deeply deeply believed in now honestly i don't know where this squad idea came from it just sort of happened 
I know uh, a big part of it was the dark stuff I've had to deal with personally in my life over the last few years. Every single little bit of those dark moments just contributed to this thing, and it just continued to grow inside my head. And then I decided to actually make a series out of it. But it's really more than just a YouTube video. It's, it's like, it's just, it's, I don't know. Now, a key question to ask when looking at the creation of this channel and the content that's found on it is what exactly was the inspiration for its creation? This is something that Andrew actually addressed. He talked about a one and a half month period where multiple accidents took place. He talks about two friends being injured in car accidents and then getting into a very bad car accident himself. But the ultimate trigger happened between 2012 and 2013. What happened was in February 2012, there was a kid that got killed in a car accident that I went to school with. Um, he was in his last year of high school. He was a senior. I had just graduated the previous year, but I knew him. I wasn't like good friends with him or anything, but we knew each other. And then one day I got word that he got killed on his way to school in the morning. And that event was what started this different area of production for me. And then that leads us into January of 2013, which was the ultimate demise of my mind for the most part because so many things happened in this little span of time that just destroyed me it was all the bad luck that i could have had in a year thrown into one month and a half for the most part what happened was in january mid-january i went back to college to start the new semester and i got word that uh, a kid that was in one of my classes the previous semester was killed in a car crash Unfortunately, another event happened in the first week of February, which was a car accident that I was involved in. Long story short, I got sandwiched between two cars, totaled my car in a parking lot. Of all places, a parking lot, right? Well, that added to this madness that was going on in my head, and then that sent me into an area which I had never really been in before. It was very weird, just this place in my head where I just started to get ideas like never before. But all these events that happened to me, it just opened an area in my head that, uh, honestly, it's been there before, ever since I was a kid, pretty much. There's just this area I would go into, but I just was always fascinated with the unknown, the afterlife, dying, death, ghosts, all this stuff that is just a distant reality from this world. I was just always fascinated by it. The EGS itself is a continuation of a children's show, Danny Phantom centering around Ember, a character in the show, in the ghost dimension where people go after they die. Members of the Ember Ghost Squad will seek out suicidal and depressive people, cast a spell on them, and recruit them into the fold. There's a catch, though. No men allowed. Because when you join Ember's Ghost Squad, you become a female. This plays on a hidden character trait of Randy himself in real life, his transsexuality, something he was uncomfortable discussing with people he knew something he had kept hidden from his family and friends, his neighbors, and his co-workers. Now, the content itself could be classified, well, <laughs> I think it speaks for itself. I've taken some snippets of the videos that were available on the YouTube channel. It's been pulled down since. YouTube has removed it for violating terms of service due to the suicide murder tape he had put up on it. But before that happened, I was able to download a majority of the videos, and it put together a compilation to give you an idea of the kind of quality content that would be found on the EGS channel itself. Fucking nigger. Apparently ghosts don't like black people either. It's good to know the Embers Ghost Squad is a white nationalist organization. Also, that's one hell of a way to pick a fucking Super Bowl winner. I hope you all fucking die. A good majority of the video centered around these taped sessions where People who would die or commit suicide talked about seeing members of the Ember Ghost Squad moments before they died. I looked up at the clock and saw the final minutes ticking down. And then I saw it. It was in the shadows of that window glass just staring at me. I 
don't understand how he could just say what through after all that I've done for you. Where's the logic in it? Emily, I would throw away science. I would throw away math. I would throw away my precious book collection just to have another chance. I lost. I failed. I let everybody down. <laughs> <laughs> All leading into a meta narrative, into a longer video that he was going to put out that he had animators and voice actors working on and a piece of content which he himself says helped contribute to him going on his killing spree after decades of recruiting <laughs> now as i discussed in part two when andrew when randy set up the egs the ember ghost squad he created a social media network around it, and part of that was creating Twitter accounts. But Randy didn't just make one Twitter account. Randy made numerous Twitter accounts. Now, if you remember in the retrospective I did on That Guy with the Glasses, I talked about how Spoonie One had a Twitter account for his dog, where he would roleplay as it and respond to himself. And as crazy as that may seem, Randy outdoes it because he set up at least five to six different accounts of characters from the EGS in which he would follow each other, favorite and like each other, retweet each other, and even have in-depth conversations with himself, talking about how much he loved himself from the perspective of each individual character. Now, the reason I bring that up is because on the night of the murders, when he went into the grocery store to kill his co-workers, he released on all these social media accounts, even the multiple Twitter accounts, the following messages. This info dump included a couple of things. One was a manifesto. It was written works, his journals and his thoughts over the previous year. Another was a compilation of videos of his pre-planning the crime. And we'll talk about that in part four. But the cherry on top, the real fucking winner, was the video we are about to watch. Now, I can't play all of it. It's over 20 minutes long, but I highly encourage you to go check it out because it is shithouse rat insane. It is so far off the scale of crazy, I can't do it justice trying to describe it. We're going to watch some snippets of it to give you an idea of his mental mindset going into his murder spree. You've seen the transition from the average YouTuber making any content he could to try to become popular to suddenly shifting to this obsession with a children's show where he wanted to reincarnate as a cartoon character with a ghost pussy. Now, this video was something he had been building up to. He had previously talked about how much animation he had to do just to make an opening. Um, if you haven't seen the intro yet, you should. I, I've spent about 6 to 15 months on that fucking thing to perfect it, and um, it, it costs a lot of money to make it, actually. The content on EGS I haven't really talked about yet, but few people realize that some of that stuff costs money to do. EGS, I've spent over $300 on. I'm not even kidding. Uh, over $300 went into EGS. Almost every video that goes up there could cost money. You don't realize that, and it's something I don't go into, but, you know, this is a channel that I've worked my ass off on. He had reached out to other animators, to other people that did this sort of work, to try to get their help to make the video, but they didn't deliver on time. And so you will see a jump in quality from semi-passable flash animation that you would find on Newgrounds back in 2004 to cartoon doodles that a semi-retarded child would make in kindergarten. And he is extremely angry about that because this was his coup de grace. This was his I hate the world and I'm going to kill people video. And it didn't get the production value he was going for. Just watching the opening and reading the text scrawl really helps to highlight that. He is really pissed off about it. Nothing says totally sane individual like making out with your shotgun and then doing a music video in your bedroom. A bedroom, which I might add, is completely covered in wall-to-wall -wall posters 
of Danny Phantom Cartoon and My Little Pony characters. I hope you all die. The waves keep on crashing on me for some reason. One of the other things that the video helps to really illustrate is that Randy obviously was a very introverted person, somebody who was mocked openly for his obsession with the children's cartoon because some of the lines of dialogue, some of the bullying dialogue you hear in this is just pure comedy. Andrew's the lankiest, gayest kid in the county of Westboro! What'd you say, bitch? Shut your mouth, you goddamn whore! Hey, Andrew! I heard you like to print out girls' Facebook pics and jizz on their faces! Hold her down, grab her legs! Hey, look, there's Andrew John, his little girls again! Snip that bitch's hair off! Hey, Andrew! How big's your dick? I bet you jerk to your precious drawings because you can't get any real pussy! Hey, Rachel, how does my semen taste in your mouth? Do you even know what you want to do with your life? Rachel, you're failing math again. Why don't you ever hang out with anybody? There's a bloody tampon in her sandwich. She's probably fantasizing about my dick in his mouth. Quick, shove it down her shirt. Hey, Andrew, got any lube? Why don't you have a boyfriend, Rachel? Why don't you have a boyfriend, Rachel? Why don't you have a boyfriend, Rachel? Shut the fuck up! Now, I want you to see if you can pinpoint the moment that this goes from semi-passable production value into finger paint mode. <laughs> And of course, you have to end it with how he envisions what's going to happen after his suicide. Because once he's done killing himself, that's when he gets his ghost vagina. And again, just to reiterate, these are just a few, a few, just minor snippets of this amazing video. This pure fucking insane look into the mind of a disturbed individual. He put this up thinking it was going to wow people. This was the video he put up that was going to make a statement to the world. I don't know what the statement he imagined it was going to make was, but I know the one I interpret it as that he was suffering from some form of fucking autism. Now, that manifesto, the information that he had posted along with this video, the journal pages, the videos leading up to the executions that he performed at his workplace, paint a very interesting picture of who this person was. This wasn't a spur-of-the-moment thing. This is something he methodically planned out for at least a year, training himself to use weapons, purchasing weapons, and planning on carrying this out on a specific date a date he hints at on social media and even his wiki page. You can see the date listed clearly, Andrew Blaze Day. And on his Facebook account, which again is now deleted, but some screen caps remain. Look at the smugness of these statements. 
Something big is coming. Get ready for this date. He was gleeful about what he was going to do. And to really see that in its fullest context, we need to look at the manifesto information he left. To really see how much he planned this and the bizarre rationale that he left behind. <laughs> What's up? Now, in the collected tome of information that Randy left behind, there were many different documents and formats that were included. Among them was a journal. Now, I'm not going to be focusing on that for a few reasons. The main reason being that their insight and importance is secondary to the videos themselves. There's a lot more you can glean from a video than you can from writing. The behavior and mannerisms of an individual in a video, their cadence and how they carry themselves, the things they say and the way they look when they say them, gives you a better understanding of their mindset when you're trying to get the most information out of it. Now the videos included in the manifesto follow Randy as he's planning his action at the supermarket. In fact, it even predates that. He lets a coin flip decide where the massacre is going to occur. Okay, so here's the deal. Got a 1983 quarter right here. You believe in fate? Here's the fate test. I'm gonna flip this three times, or the best out of three, rather. And if it's heads, I'll do it here. If it's tails, supermarket. Once the location had been set and he was working on his video, you can still see the anger he has at the animators for not contributing to his final video. It's meant to be amazing, and yet I had to do everything, which fucking animators can kiss my ass for that. Now, a good majority of the film that he left behind was his use of guns. All right, so back up at the shooting range again. Uh, I just brought Mackenzie this time, just for the sake of being secretive about it. And that's a detail I should probably expand upon. He named his shotguns. He named his shotguns after characters in the Ember Ghost Squad. He gave them personalities. He named them after his own OC. And along with the shotguns, he made sure to get a lot of ammunition because he wanted to practice as much as he could. <laughs> I, I can't fuck. Like, there's 250 fucking shells! 250 rounds of ammunition! What the fuck? Now, you might be curious why he would need that much. Well, if you remember the Polygon playthrough of Doom, that's basically Randy's shooting ability. He fired 50 times in the store and only killed three people. That's averaging roughly 16 shots a person with a shotgun at close range to kill somebody. Randy was not very skilled with weaponry. Nonetheless, he was excited. He was looking forward to the murder-suicide. There's just, there's a lot that can change the date of this thing. In a way, I firmly believe it will be June 7th. Um, in reality, it'll be the 8th because it'll be past midnight, but um, that's what I'm thinking. It's getting to the point now where I just, I want it to be here. I just, I want to go. I'm tired of envisioning putting that barrel in my mouth and pulling the trigger, you know. Every time I look at that suicide picture of Eric Harrison telling Klebold, it's like, I just want it to be here already. It's just, it's going to be like that. The whole thing is just going to be like that. Not just how he was going to take himself out, but the amount of power he was going to feel when he killed other people, when he held their life in his hands. My, uh... <laughs> There's going to be all kinds of thoughts racing through my head in those final few minutes, just like, like, I'm, 
I'm so weird. Like, there's gonna be so much adrenaline flowing through me. I'm gonna feel like more powerful than I ever have in my life. And there's not gonna be anyone that's gonna be able to stop me. Now, a good majority of the videos that are included in the manifesto are upwards of an hour. Some of them are just car rides where he's talking about his planning and how he's going to go about the massacre. Other times it's filmed in his room, talking about the different steps he's going to take to make sure the exits are blocked and who he's going to target and what time he's going to commit the attack. But it's the last two videos of the manifesto that really give an insight into his mindset and what set all of these events into motion and the rationale behind them. It's like there's EGS recruits telling me to do it in my head. Do it. Do it. It's not schizophrenia or anything like that. But it's like there's spirits telling me in my head, do it. These last two films were dedicated to his parents. And in them, he explains quite a bit. Now you have to remember, they don't know much about their son. They're probably not even really aware of his YouTube channel, so he has to go through the steps of explaining what the hell Ember's Ghost Squad is and the significance it plays in his life. Like if you look on the poster behind me, those were inspired by Ember McLean, which is a ghost from a TV show called Danny Phantom, which started back in 2003, 2004. You know, I was in late elementary school at that time. But this ghost... This woman always connected with me. Ever since I first saw her, it just, something changed. It was like a spark. And it just connected with me, it made me feel warm inside. And it felt very familiar, which was strange. It was like I'd seen her before. But at the time, it was a brand new show. And nothing had ever been done like that before with that type of character. Like, you never saw that character anywhere else except that show. And um, I just grew attached to her. Unlike anything I ever have in my life. It's just one thing I'll say is like that white stain on the floor, like that splotch you'll see on my carpet. That was an ember thing. I just, I wanted to make my skin as white as possible to look like her. I wanted it to be completely white. So I bought this, this body paint, which was like, I don't even know what it was. It was like latex shit that like, it becomes like glued to your skin and you got to peel it off. And it got on the carpet, and then it got freaking in my body hair, which, like, almost never came out at the time. What little body hair I had at the time, anyways. But um, that stuff never came off. <laughs> it's funny. As I said, 2013, Ember came back into my life, and she was never out of it again. Even further than that, he goes into the fact that he is a transsexual, a cross-dresser. If you listen to his language when he's talking about it, he almost sounds upset that they never noticed, almost like he was leaving hints out that he was disturbed, that there was something wrong with him, and that he was hoping they would call him on it. But this is just when things started to change with me in 2013. It's when I started, um, I guess you could say cross-dressing, which is something you never knew I did. I was cross-dressing ever since high school. And what would happen would be when you guys would go to your bowling leagues and Jeremy would go with you, which was every Wednesday, I would either film a YouTube video, you know, back in early high school, you know, 9th, 10th, 11th grade. I would pretty much always film a YouTube video between 9th and 10th grade on every Wednesday when you would go out the door. So I would either film a video or I would cross-dress. And that's something I've kept to myself my whole life. I never told anybody about this. And... It's something that probably shocks you, but at the same time, it's like, well, yeah, you never had a girlfriend or anything like that, so I guess it's expected, but um, the more I wore girl clothes, the more I felt like that was who I was. Like, I felt like I was a girl, and I found out that I was. I was never meant to be a guy. I was just a female soul trapped in a man's body my whole life. Every three days... Since, like, 2016, I've been shaving my arms and legs and entire body every three days. You wonder what I'm doing in the shower for so damn long? I'm shaving my entire fucking body. I wasn't jerking off in there. <laughs> but nobody ever questioned that. Which I don't know why. <laughs> I hid it for the longest time. I, I kept the, the girl razor in my freaking desk over there. And I just got tired of hiding it. I'm like, well, they're gonna have to eventually know anyway. So I just started leaving it on the counter. But nobody question it which I couldn't believe that shocked me as time went on I thought like Rachel like I thought my name was always Rachel but 
I don't know. But that's when that started, and that was the lead character for EGS. Me. He also brings up the fact that he is obsessed with school shooters, namely the Columbine killers. I drew it. I drew my own version of that suicide picture. I literally traced over it and made my own version of it. If you look really close, you will see it. But unless you know exactly what it looks like, you won't even notice that it's there. But there's two angles of that suicide photo. Like, one's like the angle I mentioned. It's like an overhead view where he's over to the left like this and Dylan's like laying like this because... The police had to roll them over to check for bombs after the massacre happened. The other picture was taken, like, head on. You could see, like, Eric like this and his hands kind of covering his face. But, like, his head is, like, completely obliterated. And then you could see, like, the wound on Dylan's head and all this. And I just, I loved it. And it wasn't sexual or anything. I wasn't turned on by dead people or corpses or anything like that. I was attracted to ghosts, Yeah. Don't worry, Mom and Dad. He doesn't want to fuck their dead bodies. He just wants to screw their souls. There's no, there's no cause for concern with an admission like that. But again, this was information he never opened up about. He didn't want to go to therapy. He didn't want to be helped. It wasn't something that he was seeking help for. I know you could be thinking, like, you could have gotten help. You could have seen a psychiatrist. You could have gotten help. But the truth is, that wouldn't be me. Me being on medication, sitting in therapy. No. That alters who you are. It's not me. Never would be. All throughout my life, I was never big on living. I hated life. I almost always did. I hated meeting people. You know that full well. I just hated going through everyday life. I always did. I just, I wanted to go to Grandma and pop Ops house and get one of their handguns and shoot myself. Or completely douse myself with gasoline and light a match and hopefully it would kill me, you know. And that really comes down to the relationship that he had with his parents. Because there's a lot of buried anger there, especially directed towards his father. I'm your fucking kid and you don't know anything about me. You don't know how I truly feel about anything and I can't tell you that stuff. And then all he fucking seemed to care about was, like, me getting a full-time job and making money and then trying to move out of the fucking house and start my own life and all this shit, which I knew I'd never, I was never going to do. It's all about money, isn't it? And guess what? Money's fucking worthless. Drop dead. I don't see why it was such a big fucking deal, because I was still part-time at the store... I was still making money, you fucking whore. I was making fucking money. I wasn't just sitting around doing nothing. I was virtually full-time at the fucking store as a part-time fucking worker, you goddamn cunt. You're lucky I didn't fucking blow your goddamn head off. Very easily could have. Could have walked right into your room when you're about to fall asleep and blow your goddamn head off and then went to the fucking store. Very easily could have done that. But I didn't. Because I wanted you to fucking suffer. And suffer hard. When's the last time you ever said you were proud of me? When's the last time you ever said I love you? When's the last time you ever did anything for me? Never. Never. It almost seems like part of his motivation was to punish them. Punish them for not knowing who he was and what he was into. For making him try to have a normal life. For making him try to go to school and get a job and move out and be successful. He was bitter and resentful for it. He was angry that they were pushing him that direction. And he wanted to make them suffer. Hello, my name's Randy. And I have a problem. You know, there's always a risk, people assume, when you discuss things like this, when you talk about a spree killer or a serial killer, that you're glorifying what they did, that by talking about it, you'll inspire others to follow suit, that people want to follow in their footsteps. What they fail to take into account is that when the mainstream media covers something like this, it's very cut and dry. They discuss the events and the tragedy, but they don't focus on the individual, and more importantly, they don't ensure that people don't want to follow it by doing one simple step, 
by mocking the shit out of this joke of a fucking human being. Randy Stairs is a transsexual brony that believed he could become a fucking cartoon ghost. He is a walking punchline. He was upset mommy and daddy didn't love him enough. He didn't want to get a real job. He wanted to do YouTube as a career. He wanted to become a ghost girl and paint himself with latex paint, put on a dress, and play pretend. Now, you could say there are a lot of things that contributed to that, that there was magical thinking involved, that that's a clear sign of schizophrenia. You could look at the events in 2013 and say that the car accident had some impact on him, that he had some kind of a brain trauma that flipped a switch and made him go insane. Either way, when you talk about Randy Stairs, if you want to ensure nobody wants to be like him, make sure that they laugh at him because nobody wants to be a joke. That's what this man's legacy is. Nobody's going to watch the videos he put up and think, my God, how badass. How inspiring is that? Randy Stairs is the fucking battleborn of spree killers. I feel no sympathy for him. I don't feel sorry for Randy Stairs. I feel sorry for the three people he murdered. Three people that did nothing to him. Three people that worked with him and had families of their own had mortgages and payments they needed to make, had children they had to raise, and were killed by this angsty piece of shit who wanted to play pretend and LARP in real life, who wanted to make mommy and daddy upset. Fuck Randy Stairs. Make fun of Randy Stairs. Show the videos Randy Stairs made to other people so they can laugh at what a failure Randy Stairs is. Nothing he did ever succeeded. Nothing he attempted ever found success. Fuck Randy Stairs.